Hey everyone, this is George Kroos and welcome back to another monthly edition of the Best of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. A great way to highlight some of the incredible guests that we've had and just some of the connections that they made and also share, you know, like a little story. I always like to try to have a little intro, but before you do that, I'd love for you to like um, this video below uh, on YouTube. It's always wonderful to kind of grow and connect uh, with you all. And one thing I encourage you to do is if something resonates from one of my guests, please write in the comments, let them know, because I think a lot of times we hear some great things, but we don't acknowledge it. And I know people, you know, always appreciate that. And before we get in the podcast, um, I want to share a little something I heard that really was meaningful to me. And just to put in a little context, um, the last few weeks, I've been feeling great. I've been feeling really, really awesome and feel full of energy, a lot of confidence, a lot of optimism. And before that, I wasn't feeling great. I was struggling and I have been struggling for a while. And I heard this thing, uh, there was like an actor's conversation. And I think it was like Tom Hanks, maybe Robert De Niro. I can't remember, but I remember Tom Hanks specifically. And they said, what's like one thing that you want to share that, you know, you wish you'd have known when you were younger or something like that. And Tom Hanks says, this too shall pass. And they kind of looked, you know, when they heard that, and they said, you know, having a rough time, things going bad, this too shall pass. Things are going really well. Things are going awesome. This too shall pass. And, I, you know, I'm probably messing up the story, but I thought it was a really powerful message that sometimes we, we feel we're in this mood and then we wonder why we get into these ruts when things are so going so well. And then the opposite as well. And it's not that we shouldn't embrace these good opportunities. And it's not that it's, it's not okay to struggle. It was totally fine to struggle, but it's that memory that this is life. And that's the beauty of it. The ups are great, but they don't become so great without the downs. And I, I remember uh, one of my favorite movies is Vanilla Sky. In Vanilla Sky, they share this message. And I just thought it was one of my favorite lines it says, just remember the sweet is never as sweet without the sour. And I know the sour. So that idea of this too shall pass is something I think really resonate with me. And sometimes it will pass on its own. Sometimes we got to do things to make those moments pass. Um, sometimes we got to do things to create those moments that we don't want to pass, but they will. So I just thought that was a really great message. I hope it connected with you all. But if not, I guarantee you something from one of my incredible guests this month will stick with you. And so here's the highlights from the month of February for the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Jason actually does a lot of work in the stem. And the company you work with is called Vex. Is that correct? Correct. Vex Robotics. And so that's, correct. that's what he does. But you've also, and I love this about you and I appreciate it, is that you also said you've been an educator for 20 plus years as well. So you yeah. bring those fields. And I love, I'm finding that we're, I'm connecting with more and more people that are business, businesses are tapping into that have education backgrounds. And it shows like, all the stuff that you can teach because a lot of these businesses are realizing how important it is to be adaptable, to be able to really kind of learn on the fly. And so I appreciate that. So from your experience as an educator, you look back and you mentioned about the collaboration thing. So you've had some ups and downs of a career like all of us have had. You look back at, and you think about the teachers that you've worked with or who taught you, who's someone in, who has inspired you and why? Yeah, so I'll take this a slightly different approach. And I tell this story in the introduction to my book. I was a first year teacher and the woman across the hall from me, we'll just say her name is Michelle. She was one of these teachers, the last three months of the year, she shut her classroom down. Didn't do what anything you would refer to as traditional teaching and basically had her kids perform skits and plays and do things like that. And as a first year teacher, I remember looking down on her and thinking I would never do that. We had a new principal that year when I got hired and he was, he would talk about how basically I never want to see you do that when you're teaching, stick with what you're doing. She retired that year. Fast forward a year later, a bunch of friends and myself, we decide we're all going to run a leg of the Pittsburgh. So we're all in a warm up area. We all wearing Hope Ball t-shirts because we were fundraising and had a gentleman come up to me, saw the Hope Ball on my shirt and said, Hey, you graduate from Hope Ball. I teach there. He says, I graduated from Hopewell and proceeds to tell me how he's an orthopedic surgeon, very successful. 
says to me, hey, when I was in fifth grade, I was a troubled kid. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was head down, the basically the path wrong. And this one teacher turned my life around. Everything that I have right now, it would have hurt. And it was that teacher that I looked down upon my first year teaching. I never forgot that story. I've told that story numerous times because again, nothing works everywhere. Something's going to work somewhere. And I think having that humility and understanding that each classroom has its own context, each student has its own context that they bring in. And trying to think about that from the perspective of teaching and learning, I think it is very important. And and just to connect it back to the book again, one of the things that I try to do with the book is just basically talk about, you have all these different camps of education. You have people saying that the teaching of knowledge is very important and things like direct instruction are important. Then you have people saying that the discovery-based learning is important and we shouldn't be doing direct things like direct instruction. We should be allowing the kids to learn these things on their own. And basically what I try to say is I try to say, listen, there's all these different competing things out here. Here's what's worked for me. Here's what I think is effective, but I want to give you the means to find out what's going to work for you and your students. I love that. That's such a great story too. And like, I actually wrote this down that sometimes what is valued in education is not often, is not always what's valuable in education. Yeah. Really thinking about that too. Right. And saying you should be doing this, but. What did you you remember? How does it affect them as they move forward? I love that. And you talked about business and this is something I believe, this is why oftentimes teachers are very effective when they go into the business world. And then conversely, this is why you're seeing so many things around teachers burn. You think about why people get involved in education. They love children. They love seeing the light bulb go off. They get, they love the subject that they're teaching, but what as teachers, what they're assessed upon, none of those conversations normally ever happen. You don't have a conversation about what really can lit the fire for your students there, or what really did this or that. Whereas in business, it's the exact opposite. We're so worried about retaining good talent that we oftentimes want to have those conversations with the people that work with us and say things like, hey, what, what are you enjoying the work? What do you want to do to continue to challenge yourself? What are the things that really make sure that you enjoy coming to work every single day? But sadly, mm-hmm. those are conversations that teachers rarely have. I think I talked about this in interviewers mindset is that when you talk about leadership, sometimes that's being in the front, sometimes that's being on the side, and sometimes that's being behind, right? Actually knowing. And uh, when I looked at who I hired, I never tried to hire George clones. I didn't want to hire people like me. I wanted to hire people who complimented me and had strengths that I didn't have because I would need that. And then there's a really important aspect of this. If you hire people that have strengths that you don't have, then you better also be comfortable stepping aside when that when those things you know come up and those things happen because sometimes you put those people in those positions to lead but then when you know it gets down to it you step in front of them even though they have the expertise right and you have to like i think great leaders know when to like Step lead from aside. the back right and like just be behind and say like hey you're you're the expert on this you, you need to lead and so when we were talking about this before, and this ties in beautifully to this, you were talking about the shared leadership framework, something that you're really passionate about. So tell us, like, what, what do you mean when you say a shared leadership framework and how does that actually look like in your school? So can you, um, can you imagine what that feels like when you have the trust of your administrator that, you, that, that they know that they um, trust you to implement whatever it is that we've been asked to do? And so empowering teachers with understanding of of whatever we're doing and then allowing them to lead there we're building the capacity for shared leadership, not just in one classroom, but in multiple classrooms. So I guess what what I'm really excited about and what, what it really drives me is what can I do as a leader to empower teachers with what they need to know and be able to do. And I know I mentioned that before, but it's, it's really true. It's like, I'm not sure I'm answering your question right, but shared leadership really has provided us with a platform to build the capacity of understanding for teachers in, in independently and as teams in order to further the momentum of student learning. And so I always think about, you know, what does that feel for a teacher that my principal is um, entrusting me to um, do this thing and to do it well and to share my knowledge with other colleagues. I want to retain my teachers. I want to I want to have them stay here for a long time. And so I can't do everything. And so I need to count on them to do these other things and giving them the um, 
permission to or empower to to do that, I can only imagine what that feels like as a teacher to have that trust of your administrator. So I try to give that trust to them when I can and to build their um, faith in themselves, um, faith in what they're doing and belief in what they're doing. You know, when we talk about that mind shift, that mind belief, you know what? I want them to experience that and feel that. And then the most important thing is when I see it, I celebrate it, right? It's like, let's stop let's stop just for a second. Did you see what you just did? Did you see the impact it had on the, your students in the classroom? It just happened yesterday. I watched a teacher in our newcomers program and she, it was an area of strength for her. And the feedback that I gave her, it's like, you taught me this, this, and this. Can you share that with your colleagues? I, I can't wait to hear what that conversation was about because this was an area of strength that I saw in you and our kids were were blossoming under that instruction. And that's just a small example of, of what one leader can do is to recognize mm -hmm. it, to celebrate it, and to, to, to build that capacity for understanding and, and sharing the, the load. When you look at the outside of experience, what you did is you provided some really practical ideas. And I know that it's from a uh, kind of holistic perspective of your time as an educator and the time that your work doing now. So what are some of the things that maybe you, if you were in the classroom and maybe an example that you share in your book would do for, because of the stuff that you learn outside of education? Because I think some kids, this is experience is sometimes kids, we're so basically in school that kids are really good at school when they walk out, but they're not necessarily having real world I don't even say I don't even have to say the term real world just real like real learning that happening so like when you worked outside of education what are some of the experiences that you had that maybe would have reshaped some of the things that you would have done in school if you were to go back that's a great question and play off a little bit about your real world we always hear that in the context of school and, I, and people always want to have experiences that are more real world and my response to that is that there's no more real world than school. So I think my experience beyond education has taught me that I think I'm always impacted and the, and the book makes a case for this is that the world of school is somewhat isolated and siloed in the sense that school needs to be. And what I've learned is that school needs to be much more experiential and expose kids to a greater range of experiences where they have to have to develop certain different qualities. I talk in the book about lifelong, life-wide, and life-deep learning. And lifelong learning is a trajectory. It's over the lifetime. It's a linear distance. When we talk about life-wide learning, we're talking about along that timeline, a greater range of experiences that teach kids and expose them to different conditions. A lot of the, and when you do that, you have a chance to develop what's called life deep learning experience opportunities. And that's where kids learn the things that relate to being human, the qualities of, for, of being human, for example, empathy, persistence, resilience, being collaborative, and all those things that we want kids to be. There's an opportunity to, the biggest thing for me is my, and certainly in my work as an entrepreneur, people always ask me, are you going to hire somebody? I said, no, I don't need to do that. Because what I do is I assemble a team on demand. That's the way that works. You don't literally have employees, but you have people in your network that you rely on. You bring them onto projects. The world of the classroom, and I still see it, George, and, I, and, it's, and it, it's, it still shapes my thinking in a lot of ways. I still, when I walk into schools, I still see the rows of steel frame desks with the teacher at the front with, nobody learns like that anymore, except in schools. And there's the greater range of experiences that provide kids with opportunities to grow in different directions and develop the qualities that, that are meaningful for them as people and as citizens and as people that will support democracy and things like that. These are all essential things that schools, and we go, you take kids on the field trips and that word really bothers me in a lot of ways in the sense that you go get in a bus, you scurry back, you go out to some a museum or someplace and you scurry back to the safety. The drawbridge goes up and you go into the, the school again. The world works in, in this way and it's all connective. It's all integrated together. There's massive opportunity for kids to explore different directions. I think sometimes we get in schools, we get limited by the potential outcomes of what kids can look at. And we look at going to college and we're going to four year, two year, going 
from the military going to work. I'd love to see schools focus on things like entrepreneurship and mm. developing additional ways in which kids can grow and develop. I think going back to your question, it's what I've learned outside is that there's this need for this greater connective, more deep and engaging human kind of experience that school can provide. When recording this, just probably about a month and a half ago, Chat GPT was everywhere. And, yep. and I think, and I don't know, it, like where it was, maybe I wrote the book for you. Who knows, right? Maybe that's what I thought. <laughs> we'll never know, will we? We'll never know, right? And one of the things that I've started to do is I've actually started to utilize it in my own learning to figure it out from the viewpoint of a learner. So then I could give effective strategies to talk about teaching. What I'm watching is a lot of people saying, here's a project, here's a thing. And I'm like, how did you, how do you know that? how do you know this right and i think a lot of times we jump straight to the teaching without doing the learning for example mm. i wrote a blog post yesterday and i i talked about the book the four agreements now i read the entire book and i i, I read the entire book and but then i actually said and so i asked chat gpt to summarize what the four agreements are and provide me a quote so i, I actually say that in my blog post and it's bang on right and then I use it just like I would say, this is from Wikipedia. This is from this website. I just said, this is from chat GPT. So I, I didn't pretend something else. Right. But, but then I actually took my own context and, and then shared things that chat GPT wouldn't know. Cause they're not George stories, right? Like I can't say like, tell George Crow stories. So right. like, how did I actually take my learning from and combine it as opposed to replace it? Right. And I think that's, what's going to separate what we do in education with this. Is it something that chat GPT could, is it an assignment that chat GPT could just answer for you? Or is it something that we could utilize it, but you still have to get that real human element, that real the empathetic sure. story. Yeah. Sound. So how do you see the chat GPT and its use, the connection to what you talk about in your book? That's a great question. And so one of my chapters, it's called relationships versus robots. Right. And I talk about the importance of relationships as teachers, as the human element, and also talk about the importance of technology and its role in education as well. I point out that there are advantages and pros and cons to both. And if there really is a foreseeable future where robots or computers could overtake teachers. And so at the end of the chapter, giveaway, spoiler alert, I talk about shifting that question to think about rather than relationships versus robots, how can we think of it as relationships with robots, right? Mm -hmm. Technology is so ubiquitous and accessible these days that we have to use it in order to use our learning to amplify it and make it better, right? And so how can we have those relationships with technology so that we can use it in more powerful ways to really help to accelerate our learning as opposed to not using it, right? And so there's always something that will be the next best thing that comes along that really pauses us and really makes us question technology use, right? Before it was the pen, this will be permanent, we won't be able to erase right. it, right? Jumping all the way to now. We can't foresee what these next technological advances will be, but I think we have to have the attitude and the approach to learning with it and thinking about how we can use it to promote good in the world and mm -hmm. what should we be cautious about in terms of potential downfalls that it could create? If we have those attitudes, I think it'll be really helpful for us to navigate some of these really difficult decisions that schools face about whether or not to include it, whether or not to block it, or should we just put more energy into working with students to teach them to make better digital decisions when using these types of technologies? Yeah. Like when you're talking about this, uh, the the analogy that I think about, and I don't know if you remember, remember Khan Academy, right? I don't oh, know. Oh, yeah. I'll use it, right? So when Khan Academy first came out, it's a great example. Like, oh, oh, my God. Like, this is going to, we're going to become, some people were like terrified this is going to replace teachers. I never had that concern ever. Right. And I, my argument was like, if you, if that's the way you teach, <laughs> then you're in trouble. Yeah. But I, I don't teach like that. There is an element of that. And so was there a benefit in Cod Academy? And I'm sure people still use it as a supplemental re resource. Exactly. Of yep. course it is. Right. And that's the same way I'm looking at ChatGPT. It's not a replacement, but unless we 
act in the way that we would use it as a replacement. So how do you make that a supplemental resource versus this? Cause I, I was never, there was not one day where I was worried that Khan Academy was going to replace what I was doing just the right. same way. I'm not worried about chat GPT, but I am going to use those things and I'm going to sure. see the benefit of it, and I'm going to take, I'm going to leverage them to do things that actually, I know this sounds weird that actually need less thinking, right? Like how yeah. are you use those things that do less thinking? Automation. Actually, yeah. yeah. So I love that. I love that analogy. I've run marathons uh, years ago and I always say this, that the hardest part of a marathon is actually not the marathon is the training. The train is really, really tough. And if you do it in a proper way, by the time you get to the marathon, that should be not easy, but a lot easier than if you didn't do it. And so I decided that I was kind of floating in some of the things that I was doing with my exercise. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to do a 14 week half marathon training and just jump into week seven, because I feel like my my fitness is at a level where I, I probably could, you know, uh, be at the point where I'm okay with week seven. And what's been beautiful about this process is I don't really think about what I have to do. I don't say like, ah, maybe I'm going to do this today. I'm going to do this. I, I know, you know, basically seven weeks ahead, what I'm going to do, you know, Friday, uh, you know, five, six weeks from now. And it's, it's been really helpful to me because it, it takes away that choice of what I get to do. And so I don't really debate it at all. I just, I, I don't really worry about how do I feel that day? What's the weather like? Any of that stuff. I just, I've committed to this. I'm going to do it. And what's interesting, I don't actually have any race that I'm planning to run. I just wanted to do the training. And if a race happens to be close to that time, great. But it's not my focus. I, I do have a goal of a time that uh, I want to run in and uh to fit to complete a half marathon and so if i do that just solo if i actually enter a race uh, I'll, I'll kind of figure that out and it is kind of tweaking some of these things that i've been doing because while i do half marathon training you know going back to my advice earlier while i do half marathon training um you know seven you know seven months from now i don't know maybe maybe not but what i i think i'm trying to learn through this process is having those, you know, specific goals of what I'm going to do. So I don't kind of float. And so I make really good use of my time. Uh, when I exercise, when I make better use of my time, the time seems to go quicker and I'm more efficient with it. And I think that's what I'm trying to figure out, you know, through this process. So that's a little bit, I'm doing some of that stuff, but I'm also, you know, taking a little time to write each day. Uh, and when I feel inspired to create something and I, I feel that is, um, what I'm doing right now.